All right. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. As we get started on tonight's webinar, just some um, housekeeping uh, for Zoom. I know we've been in Zoom for a year, but not everyone spends eight hours a day on it like some of us. So um, as a courtesy to everybody else, we're going to just ask that all the audience members stay on mute. Um, also, we're going to keep everyone's videos off so that way everyone can focus on our speaker, Tice. Um, that'll allow for the best experience for everybody and it'll probably help your connection, which I know sometimes is sketchy for me. Um, at the end of the, pre after Tice's presentation, we'll do a great Q&A. So if you have any questions that come up, feel free, feel, feel free to drop, type them out in the chat. Um, I'll be collecting them while she's talking. Um, and we'll hopefully have a really good conversation at the end um, about birds and climate change and whatever else you're wondering. Uh, we do also have the option to turn on closed captioning. So you should see a little indicator down on your toolbar. You can turn it on this evening um, if that is helpful for you. I find it helpful sometimes. If you find it distracting, you can also turn it off. So um, do with how, whatever works best for you. And just a quick plug about what's coming up this spring. Um, this is one of, I think, our third or fourth webinar we've done so far this spring, and we've got a whole bunch more coming up in the next uh, month or so. Um, our next one is actually next Thursday, which it should be a really cool, interesting one. We're doing kind of a virtual book release with University of New Mexico Press, all about um, edible and medicinal shrubs in New Mexico, which I think I know nothing about, so it should be really cool. And it's hosted by the Randall Davy Audubon Center in Santa Fe. Um, in the next month, in a couple of weeks, we have, which I'm sure will be a great presentation with Paul Cashin, who's Mr. Rio Grande himself, all about conserving the Rio Grande and sort of what the future looks like for, for that river. Um, then we're going to have some awesome um, advocacy training with Judy, who is our New Mexico Policy Director. And then we'll kick off the summer with a really fun uh, program about um, our partnership working with breweries in Arizona with Steve, our outreach biologist. So if you're interested in signing up for any of these or staying in the loop with our different um, programs that we have, feel free to sign up for our Audubon Southwest newsletter. We send them out only every, every other month, I think, so we don't um, clog up your inboxes. It's also a way if we ever need to activate our membership, you know, to contact legislators or things like that to help move along um, bird-friendly policy, this is a great way to get involved as well. Um, you can also follow us on social media. We do a lot of posting of our events um, and things like that. Oops, there you go, let's admit. And so let's get to the main event. Tonight we have, a, which I'm going to be, which I'm sure is going to be a great program, Survival by Degrees, the Climate Crisis's Impact on Birds in the Southwest, which is, you know, probably one of the most relevant things we have to talk about on Earth Day this year. Um, so we are, tonight's presenter is Tice. Tice has been the Audubon, Arizona Director of Bird Conservation since 2005, after a long career with Arizona Game and Fish Department that included experiences in research, habitat management, game management, urban wildlife. Her National Audubon Society work is focused on birds and their habitat, including administration of the Arizona Important Birds Areas, also known as the IBA program. Um, sites that are critical to a complete life cycle for resident and regulatory birds are given the status. So these are pretty essential places within Arizona that she's been helping to um, coordinate. Uh, her 2008 National Audubon Society Fellowship Conservation Project was development of a partnership with Mesa Community College Geospatial Technologies Program to create a real world geospatial analysis using data related to the Important Bird Areas Program. And I know that a lot of um, your current work, Tice, relates to geospatial data as well. Uh, Tice graduated from both Cornell University and University of Arizona, both with degrees in wildlife ecology, and she's received many awards, including from the Arizona Chapter of the Wildlife Society, the Arizona Wildlife Federation, and the National Audubon Society. So Tice is definitely like our big guns of 
bird science. So we're pulling out for Earth Day tonight. Um, and she also wanted to share that she attended the very first Earth Day in, Auto in Albany um, with her Protect Your Environment Club back in college. Is that right, Tyson? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome like bookend to this kind of like long career of where it kind of all started. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let you take over. Thank you, Thanks. Katie. All righty. So let me get on a screen share here and get this into full presentation mode. So everybody able to see the yellow warbler? Yeah, I think we actually see the like presentation side of it, not the the presenter oh. side of it. <laughs> oh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. All this practice and I did it wrong. It's all right. <laughs> Let me. Um, yeah, screen number two. That's what I need. And should work better. Is that better? Perfect. All right, folks. So the survival by degrees report, 389 species on the brink, is actually the second edition of an Audubon birds and climate report, uh, which we call climate 2.0 in Audubon. And it's an update from a 2014 report um, that some of you may be familiar with where we uh, mapped out the 314 species of birds in North America uh, would suffer from shrinking and shifting ranges as a result of climate change. So we've added 75 more birds that are at risk from our two reports. And I wanted to go through what is different between them and uh, what really makes this new report more robust and a little more geographically accurate. We used a massive data set this second time around. Um, the first report used breeding bird survey and Christmas bird count, which we're, I think, going to be calling community bird counts going forward. And this time around, we assembled the largest database of bird observations for studying climate to date in North America. We used all the eBird reports. We used data from scientists who are studying birds. And uh, so that means that the data sets are much, much larger. We included as much as we could of data from Mexico and uh, Canada as well. This report also dove a little deeper into what are some of the threats that are associated with a changing climate. And we identified nine, such as heat waves, fire, early or false springs. And we were able, over to able, able to overlay these nine threats on top of this bird distribution data to see where birds are at highest risk as our climate changes. And looking at the recent report that alarmed a lot of people of 3 billion birds lost, one in, fewer, one in four birds are projected to suffer from climate impacts. And especially for our forest birds. So we looked at human land uses along with the climate. And we also added in information about predictions of how vegetation will change with a changing climate. And this is another addition to the report that was not in the first one. We also tried to put birds into group specific variables such as boreal uh, nesting birds and arid land birds. And so we ran our models by grouping the birds by their habitats, uh, wetland birds, distance to coastline, these were all factors. And so we moved away from threatened and endangered to calling all these birds vulnerable 
at some level or another. So this is showing the list of data sets that we used. So we had 140 plus million observations from 70 plus data sources. So this is pretty exciting and Audubon's actually moving forward with these data sets plus more to develop a migration uh, report that'll come out later this year. So the eBird data is particularly exciting because it can actually map the movement of these birds over time. Somebody posted in chat that they saw their first hummingbird. Well, here's the broad-tailed hummingbird of the West. And this is a uh, active map showing the movement of these birds from their winter range in Mexico up through the United States where they nest and then their return to Mexico. And so all your eBird reports are allowing scientists to put together amazing profiles like this of where these birds are at any given time of the year. So we're getting what we call a uh, full life cycle information, which is very exciting to be able to do that. This round also has a finer resolution. Uh, we were at a 10 kilometer scale for a climate 1.0. And this time around, we're down to one kilometer resolution. This allows us to zero in to geographies where we can assist with this information, assist you in climate change adaptation and planning at a local level. So a first takeaway with this report is that climate change is the greatest threat to North American birds. And we had that huge die off of migrating birds this past season. And scientists are still trying to assemble what the factors might have been. A unusual cold snap in Colorado, New Mexico, raging wildfires in California may have conspired to create a situation where these birds were uh, off course from their normal migration and perhaps were starved for food at a critical point in time. So this report does show that two thirds of North American birds are at risk at some level or another. And so going into the content of this report a little bit, uh, Audubon ran three scenarios for warming of the planet uh, one degree centigrade is where we were in 2018. So 1.5 degrees, that's the Paris Agreement goal. And then we've got a run of two degrees centigrade and three degrees centigrade. So three degrees centigrade globally would be over a five degree Fahrenheit increase in global temperature. I read a report recently that projected that without some intervention here in Arizona and New Mexico, we could experience nine degree Fahrenheit increases in temperatures. So we assess the vulnerability of our birds to these three thresholds to come up with prediction scenarios. So 97% of our North American species could be affected by multiple climate-related threats should our planet increase by three degrees centigrade, as opposed to only 20% if we can keep it at the Paris Agreement level of 1.5 degrees. So this is just a walkthrough of how we ran these models. We used the current range of a bird, and then we projected how that range might change with 
a 1.5 degree centigrade increase in temperature and a three degree centigrade degree in temperature. The dark brown on these maps are a prediction of range loss for this particular bird, the wood thrush. The green is showing where there might be movement uh, to habitats where birds, this bird will actually do better. And the pale blue is a prediction of where there might be range gain. Um, for land birds, we did not take into consideration loss of those habitats from sea level rise, but that is a factor. So this could result in local extinctions for many species of birds. So that takes us to a second takeaway from this report. For the first time, we looked at nine existential climate threats and 305 of the bird species that are threatened by climate change will actually face three or more of these threats should the global temperature raise by three degrees centigrade. If we can keep it at 1.5 degrees, only 34 bird species will face three or more climate threats. So for bird conservation, there's great incentive to try to manage the increase in temperature and to achieve the goals of the Climate uh, Paris Accord. These were the seven existential threats that these models considered. Drought, I mentioned false spring. This is where plants get tricked into flowering early and then you end up with a frost. Fire weather, which is wildfires, incinerating habitats, oftentimes repeatedly in the same places over and over. Urbanization, and part of this being a threat is that as we lose resiliency in more rural areas, um, people will move to our cities. Spring heat waves, and for here in the West, just heat waves, period. Um, endangering young birds in the nest. Heavy rains, instead of rainfall being spread out or precipitation being spread out, individual, uh, more catastrophic events. Uh, lake level rise and actually sea level rise are considered together in these models. And then cropland expansion. This is where growing agriculture causes a loss of bird habitats. And Audubon is quite concerned about that for our Great Plains region. And one of the reasons why we're trying to keep uh, use of our grasslands as native grassland and not having it convert to uh, cropland. So these maps, give you a sense of what we predict will happen with these uh, threat assessments. The uh, brownish color is the extent of the impact at 1.5 degrees centigrade. And then where it's red, that's the expansion of that threat at three degrees centigrade. So you can see for the Southwest, fire, heat and drought are the big factors for us. And at our higher elevations, uh, false springs. So climate change scenarios were um, run for each of these birds to come up with a sense of what the cumulative effects might be. And I mentioned that at three degrees centigrade, over 90% of our birds will experience three or more of these seven threats. For um, our part of the world, uh, extreme heat, as I mentioned, 
and fire and drought are the big ones. So taking a little closer look at fire, species are projected to be most affected by the higher frequencies of fire incidents. And there's other factors that feed into this um, that are additive to a changing climate. And one of this is invasive plant species. And quite a few of our plant species that have become invasive or able to outcompete our native grasses or um, herbaceous plants. They're successful because they come from a part of the world that's already hot and arid and they outcompete our native plants and set up the stage to carry fire. Uh, cheat grass in the sagebrush steppe, uh, buffalo grass and red brome and various mustards in our arid lands, um, non-native grasses in our grasslands that can carry fire more effectively. So birds that are threatened by fire event are our grassland birds if it keeps happening over and over again and you end up with a loss of your native grassland community and the birds of our western forests. Arizona and New Mexico are both uh, projected to be affected by this. Uh, some of the projection for our states having such a high number of acres is because we are large states uh, geographically. So drought and spring heat kind of go together uh, we end up with high temperatures and also a lack of precipitation. Here in Arizona, we had no summer rain precipitation of any consequence last year. We've gone through a very dry winter and minimal snowpack. Uh, again, the states that will be most affected are the states of the arid Southwest. For the first time, there may be a drought declaration at a uh, level beyond what was last year for the Colorado River. And California is already talking about uh, limiting water usage uh, to contend with the dropping levels of the reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell on the Colorado River. Many of the birds that are affected also extend into Mexico. And we hope that a subsequent report and update will add even more information from Mexico about how these birds are uh, faring there. So looking at the big picture across the continent, the birds that are at greatest jeopardy are the Arctic nesters, 16 species, where 100% of them are expected to be adversely affected by climate. This could lead to species extinction. The next highest affected group are the species that breed in the boreal forests. The third which alarmed me was the species of our Western forest, 73 species of birds. And this includes um, your higher elevation mixed conifer, ponderosa pine, and pinyon juniper. Followed by water birds, many of these birds being affected by sea level rise. And then subtropical forests, which Arizona and New Mexico uniquely have this habitat in the southeastern part of Arizona and the southwestern part of New Mexico. Grasslands, and then the eastern forests and the coastal species, some of 
the reason for coastal species potentially being resilient is that sea level rise may not completely eliminate suitable habitat for them. Arid lands, um, there's a little bit of a bias in this report and my thinking in that arid lands are treated collectively as one type. However, here in Arizona, we have a Sonoran Desert that has creosote burst sage at the lower elevations and hot and dry is a condition of that setting. And then we have the higher elevation mixed cacti, which includes the saguaro cactus. And part of a hot, dry climate could very well include losing that upland Sonoran Desert type. And in California, in the Mojave Desert, the Joshua Tree Desert, where the diversity, the biological diversity is higher. Urban and suburban and the generalist species, as one might expect, are the ones that will be least adversely affected through a changing climate and are some of the species where we can offer um, respite for these birds by decisions we make in the planning of our cities and how we um, manage our own homes and yards. So the third takeaway is that every bird species will in fact experience some kind of impact from a changing climate. One quarter of birds that are the state bird could lose the majority of their range in that state, either in the winter or the summer season. So the common loon, the state bird for the state of Minnesota might not be in Minnesota anymore, as an example. Arizona and New Mexico will probably keep our state birds for Arizona as the cactus wren and New Mexico is the road runner. Uh, being arid land birds, they will likely um, be able to adapt in place. So let's look at our Western forests for a bit. Um, I've got pygmy nuthatch up as an example bird that the range gained is like primarily at higher elevations. So these birds could get squeezed out um, if the changing climate persists. And you can see that in Arizona and New Mexico, this bird would pretty much disappear from our ponderosa pine forests and our forests that are east of Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And this is true throughout the range of this bird. And I'll mention the nuthatches again later uh, where you all can help us monitor how this species actually responds to our changing climate over time. This is a long list, I might say, for Western forest birds that include Townsend solitaire, mountain chick chickadee, um, and Clark's nutcracker. The higher elevation of the Western forests the conifer, mixed conifer and spruce fir. In Arizona and New Mexico, these habitats are likely to get squeezed out. Early in my career, a location in southeastern Arizona, and I'll just put my cursor on it for a minute right here. This is the Pinaleno Mountains. Um, well, this is the Chiricahuas and this is the Pinaleños. And the Pinaleño Mountain mixed conifer spruce fir forest has had multiple fires in the last decade. And this was considered a fireproof vegetative community 30 years ago. So the drying of the West and the lack of snowpack is making these high elevation forests very vulnerable to fire. The Clark's Nutcracker is the uh, featured bird for New Mexico's um, state report for uh, survival by degrees. 
And you can see again, this is a bird that right now is well distributed through our Western forests in our states. And with a changing climate, um, it could lose most of its current range. And northward uh, displacement. Often ignored or forgotten, the pinion and juniper woodland birds are also at risk. Uh, pinion jay and gray vireo are both Western birds of conservation concern already. Every bird has a set of environmental conditions that enable it to thrive. The pinion jay is in fact one of the most specialized birds in the United States and Canada. With its entire life history tightly connected to the availability of conifer seeds. With pinion seeds being highly favored, although, um, and as I mentioned, this bird's already of conservation concern. And you can see that a lot of the projection for the pinion jay is a displacement of its distribution northward and a loss of habitats in the southern tier. I mentioned the subtropical forests, the southeastern Arizona Sky Islands and New Mexico boot heel, but also the Apache Highlands of central Arizona and west central New Mexico. These are birds that are unique to our part of the United States and why a lot of bird watchers come to our states to see these birds. Um, and they are particularly vulnerable to increased temperature and drought as they're tied to more subtropical forest uh, environment that's found in Mexico and the Sierra Madre. The olive warbler, the bridal titmouse, the red-faced warbler and the painted red start are just some examples of the birds that you find in these habitats. And they are at the greatest risk of long-term drought and repeated fire events. It was just um, a fire started here in Arizona last week on a fire scar of a huge fire that occurred 20 years ago. So we're getting fire re-entry. This is looking at the bridal titmouse in a little bit more detail. So not only here in the United States, but in Mexico, loss of its habitat in what's predominantly ponderosa pine and lower elevation mixed conifer is predicted with the bird perhaps displacing northward. The painted red start, which is the uh, featured bird for the state of Arizona, a similar prediction of the bird being found at higher elevation, maybe using habitats that are higher up uh, after fire stand replacement, maybe more ponderosa pine and less spruce fir at those elevations. And there might be some northward uh, expansion again of this species. So I do want to talk a little bit about our arid land birds. I already touched on the subtlety of our arid lands. Um, the Chihuahuan Desert also shares these subtleties with the higher elevation Chihuahuan Desert having more um, yucca and grassland components mixed into it. Um, the Sonoran Desert where you have the columnar cacti is very rich. And although this report predicts moderate impact to these species, um, I don't believe it takes into full consideration the loss of the xeric or dry washes or these uplands. 
Uh, there's a lot of research that shows that in a hot and dry year, many of these birds do not reproduce and they will skip a year. If you have a continued hot, dry scenario, then you're gonna have local extinctions of some of these species. So it will be important to monitor these birds, um, such as the um, Gila woodpecker on the right, um, the cactus wren, and even the roadrunner. eBird records and our um, community bird counts, Christmas bird counts, are ways that volunteers can help establish data trends for these desert birds that are not migrants. So we hope that they will be resilient to a uh, changing climate as, as predicted by our models. Your effort to document where they are can be key to us developing a better understanding of how they will respond. Likewise, grasslands don't rank as high, but our grasslands could end up being a refugia for some of these birds. In Arizona, we have a race of Eastern meadowlark called the Lillian. And then of course the scaled quail is in both of our states, as is the Cassin sparrow. Audubon, Arizona, uh, with Tucson Audubon Society, published a pocket guide for use by managers and owners of grasslands in our state to help them uh, adopt management practices on their lands that will help uh, support these species of birds. In Arizona and New Mexico, we have limited habitat for our water birds, uh, our rivers such as the Rio Grande, the Verde and the Gila, the Colorado River. These are important habitats for water birds and waterfowl as are um, the various Playa Lakes. New Mexico has many more of those than we have here in Arizona. And these species can be indicators of lost habitat. Um, various surveys, again, done by volunteers, such as waterfowl counts, can help us better understand how these birds that are much more focused on specific habitats are faring. The models predict that, in fact, Western grebe will maintain about 63% of its habitat and potentially gain. Um, we'll have to wait and see if that's really true uh, because this is a bird that requires open water. And if we have reduced surface water with our reservoirs, this might not hold up. The same thing for cinnamon teal. Uh, the idea that we'll have range gain really depends on whether or not we can keep our wetlands in our grasslands and in our uh, high desert environments. So a fourth takeaway is the good news that we can take action now and help improve the risk to many of these species up to 76%. And we can all start with a first of its kind zip code tool that Audubon has created where you can zoom in on climate change impacts at your community and what are the local birds that might be affected. I will say that it's at the county scale and at least in Arizona, our counties are so huge that it's not gonna give you 
all the birds that are only gonna be found, for instance, around the deserts of Phoenix. It will also include the birds that are at Mount Ord, which is also in our county, which are higher elevation, Western forest birds. It at least is a good start to give you a sense of what things are looking like uh, in your backyard. I mentioned the nuthatches and Audubon has a national program called Climate Watch. And this is a community science effort where volunteers uh, survey for selected groups of birds twice a year, bluebirds and nuthatches. And I think they just recently added goldfinches. And my colleague, Kathy Wise, successfully argued to include the lesser goldfinch. So that's the more common goldfinch for us here. So if you're interested in climate watching, encourage you to go to that website. Those routes are established by our uh, scientists at the national level. Uh, Brooke Bateman, who was the lead scientist for this report, also oversees the Climate Watch program. It's kind of fun. You can set up your route on uh, trails or paths that you are comfortable walking. And it's, it's a growing effort and it really is a wonderful way for people to help Audubon scientists get a better handle on how these birds are responding to our changing climate. And that can contribute to refining this prediction model into the future. So that's the fifth takeaway. We know what we need to do to help protect the birds we love and to protect the places that the birds need now and in the future. And so it's really time for all of us to act. So Audubon has some policy goals for climate adaptation. One of those is to protect and expand the places birds need and there's a national initiative out right now, 30 by 30, which is 30% of the United States protected by 2030. Um, exciting news for Audubon in New Mexico was the passage of an Environmental Database Act. And this is a victory in that this is going to allow for the state to consolidate all of this data about where the biological diversity is, where the points of risk are for human development. Uh, Arizona has something similar called HabiMap. And so this is exciting to see that there are developing tools so that we can have useful and productive conversations with folks that want to um, implement projects uh, at the local level or at a larger scale. And in historic partnership, Audubon and New Mexico municipalities um, were able to release water to recharge vital habitat along the Rio Grande. And I believe uh, the next webinar, uh, one coming up, not the next one, but the one after, um, there'll be a presentation on what Audubon New Mexico in New Mexico has been doing on the middle Rio Grande. We also have a Western Water Action Network. Um, this map's a little dated. We were initially focused on the Colorado River. The Rio Grande River is now a very important part of this uh, initiative. And Audubon uh, produced a report um, birds and water. And Audubon has been the first to really try to grapple with what we call the saline lakes of the Intermountain West. Great Salt Lake being the best known in Salton Sea. There's many other wetland sites through the West that are absolutely essential for stopover, 
and breeding for many water birds. And I am personally really excited to see that we're now talking about these lakes as a system that is interrelated. So we don't just focus on one location. All those stars on some of those lakes indicate that they are uh, important bird areas in the Audubon Important Bird Area Network. So by taking action personally and politically, we can hold our planet's increasing thermostat to that 1.5 degrees Celsius or centigrade. And we'll protect 76% of our bird species in North America. And that's a big deal. I do think it's possible. There's lots of ways to go at it. I'm encouraged that we now have an administration at the national level that's talking about climate change seriously. And that um, various industries are starting to look towards the need to leave fossil fuel. So in Arizona and New Mexico, this gives you a sense of where we were a couple of years ago on where we get our electricity. Um, Arizona does have a nuclear generating plant. Um, Arizona has a target of having greenhouse gas emissions be the same as 2000 by 2020. I don't think we met it. <laughs> and 50% reduction by 2040 and increasing our renewables portfolio to 15% by 2025. New Mexico, I like their renewable portfolio target. They want 80% by 2040. So we need more um, commitment to that kind of movement away from fossil fuels. Um, I will say that in Arizona, hydropower is part of our power source, as it is for California. And with the dropping levels in the big reservoirs in the Colorado River, our cities could be destined to be faced with rolling blackouts because they can't generate enough electricity from those dams. I want to acknowledge the team at National Audubon Society that put this report together. I mentioned Brooke Bateman. She is the lead on this effort. And then Lodum Taylor and Joanna Wu are um, geographic information systems experts. Jeff LeBaron has overseen our Christmas bird count for many, many years. Henrik Westerkam, and then Chad, he needs his title changed. He is our chief scientist and vice president of conservation and science for National Audubon Society. I wanna close out by encouraging all of you to go to our um, survival by degrees report. And if you just type that into your search engine, it'll pop up. And if you scroll down, there's the Birds and Climate Visualizer, and you can search by uh, zip code or pick a state. And when you do that, your state if you uh, will come up and you'll see state-specific information about how climate change will affect the birds where you live. And as I mentioned, do stay tuned for a new report mapping migration and linking that data set to the climate vulnerability predictions. So what we're hoping to have is more detailed information about where migrating birds need us to make sure that where they stop over and where they breed is there for them. 
So with that, um, I will bring this um, presentation to a close. Thank you so much, Tice. That was excellent. Um, I learned a ton and there's a lot of like really moving, I think, statistics in that and you know a lot of very familiar birds that I see around that I am worried about you know those evening grosbeaks and picnic nut hatches um if so now I know it's almost the end of our hour so if folks need to go eat dinner that's totally fine um but if you've got questions feel free to drop them in the chat and um I'll kind of aggregate them for Tice in just a minute I'll make a plug about our next webinar um, coming up in just a couple of weeks, like what Tice was talking about with um, the Rio Grande and the water releases. That's all the work under Paul Tashin and his Rio Grande team with Amy Erickson and Quentina Martin and a bunch of other organizations, agencies, and partners. Um, so feel free to, I put the registration link in the chat. If you sign up for our newsletters, you will also get um, updates about other, you know, programs that get added and everything. Um, so you can stay in the know. And like I, we also have mentioned, we do activate our network from time to time. And that was um, really important for the environmental database bill actually in New Mexico is we had hundreds of people reach out to our state legislators. Um, and so we really appreciate all of our members across both of our states and our region. So thank you everyone. Um, I see that there's some questions coming in. Uh, all right. So you feel ready to take a couple of questions, Tice? <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to have to figure out how to stay in touch with some of these people, like Willard Heck. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the Cornell uh, alum. And oh, nice. Awesome. Cheers. And uh, um, yeah, so go ahead with the questions. Great. Well, we received um, a question from John. Um, you know, how, what, how best can we support ground nesting birds as things become hotter and drier in the Southwest? You know, specifically, how do we best improve their nesting and their loafing areas? Yeah, so within your own home and the, uh, your yard, there's lots of opportunities by planting native plants and consider native shrubs and trees that will create shade. Um, you know, I actually live in downtown Phoenix and I um, planted a, a native blue palo verde tree and instantly got a family of verdans that are now in my yard and they built their nest in that tree. So it doesn't take much to make it um, a, a compatible environment for these birds. On the larger landscapes, <clears throat> the more we can do to prevent catastrophic fire uh, in some of these systems, uh, that's probably the most important thing to focus on. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Audubon does have a really great native plant database, and I can put that into the chat in just a minute um, that will help people if you go look up um, plants for birds. You can also type in your zip code and it'll tell you a lot of different options. So native plants, yeah. definitely one of the best things for, for I do change. see a question real quick here about whether mm -hmm. there's peer reviewed publications and the answer is yes. And if you go to our website, you can go to the resources under um, the, the website section that addresses our climate report. And so, yes, uh, a lot of published uh, reports for this one and the one prior. Yeah, and I did put the links to um, both of our state pages. And if you go to the main um, species by degree page, you can, you can download the whole report. It is a very large PDF, um, but it's got, again, it's all of those peer reviewed good science that we like. Um, great, uh, so another question, was, was the data that was shown tonight, um, was that from the original survival by degrees or is that, um, is, are, is all of that from the original data All that data, data is from the 2.0 report. Mm -hmm. so all, all the information I presented tonight is from the newest report, the update. 
Great. And Lisa wanted to know how recent are these figures? And Lisa, I'm not sure if you were talking about the political figures or the data. So feel free to. Yeah, the 2018, the I believe, is when we we published all of this. Mm -hmm. 2018, late 2018, early 2019. So. Um, yeah, it hasn't been that long, and I can't no. imagine anything's changed substantially since. No, the thing that might have changed is some of the data that's in those re in our website about what the various states are doing in terms of um, fossil fuel goals and movement towards renewables. That's mm -hmm. probably something that could be freshened. I, I I know that there were a few things in Arizona that looked hopeful, and then. Uh, we had a rollback this past year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So Carol had a question about, uh, does any of the citing information, like through the Audubon app and through eBird, does that help with the research side of your work and reports like this? Yes, it does. Um, one of the things uh, ornithologists, bird scientists encourage folks to do with eBird, if you want to make your report even more valuable, is maybe, you know, before you begin your daily bird walk, spend five minutes at the start, and just do a, a stationary count for five minutes of the birds that you detect and submit that. That's actually a very valuable piece of data uh, rather than your trip count where you maybe walk three, four miles or stop. It's, it's a tighter data set. The other thing is to, um, every time you stop your vehicle and get out to look at birds, that's a new eBird report. And that's a habit that I've gotten into. Uh, I didn't know that. That's really helpful to know. Uh, right. I've gotten into the habit of birding everywhere, not just at the like exciting IBAs or the like right. the really birdy places, but birding in urban centers and even parks and things like that is also really valuable data. Um, well, research. yeah, I've been known to quickly park my vehicle and record an unusual bird that I've seen. And I'll just submit that as an eBird report just to get a point on the map for a bird that's not typically found at that location. Yeah, for sure. I also have been known to pull over the car <laughs> with the rare bird. Yeah. Um, uh, so Joanne's asking, what is Audubon doing to connect with restoration programs that generate water soaking places like rainwater catchment ponds and beavers in rivers? I don't know the answer. Oh, to <laughs> beaver! I'm a beaver believer. So I love the idea of beavers in rivers. And um, rainwater catchments, uh, certain parts of um, the US that works better than others. I've got rain barrels at my house and they haven't filled up for over a year, <laughs> which is kind of discouraging. But Audubon um, definitely uh, promotes permaculture practices. And again, we, I think we're planning some webinars on plants for birds more information there into how, um, as gardener, uh, you can promote wetted areas by the way that you garden with uh, catch basins and that kind of thing. And uh, at the larger scale, we are very involved with partnering with others for conservation and restoration of our rivers and streams and wetlands throughout the nation. Great. It um, looks like Peter's got a question just about what's Audubon's position on nuclear power. And I don't know that we have a public. Yeah, I just heard an update from our policy folks in climate. <clears throat> and, and so the position Audubon is developing is that there is emerging technology for nuclear energy that removes a lot of the issues related to the current situation with what do you do with spent rods and that kind of thing. And so National Audubon is developing a, 
a statement or a position around smaller scale nuclear power um, that won't have those sidebar issues. Okay, also something new I learned tonight. <laughs> I just well, learned that. I happened oh, okay. to be on a call last week. <laughs> so breaking information, great. Well, it looks like we've kind of slowed down in the chat. Um, and, you know, we are after our, um, our, our time allotment. So I think we'll probably wrap things up now. Um, but Tice, thank you so much for this presentation. There was so much good science in there and a lot of information that I'm sure people will be chewing on for a long time. Um, so, you know, I put the links to this, uh, the report in the chat. So feel free to go through that and check it out. It's got some really good um, graphics, really good ways of storytelling that data, because I know a lot of data is overwhelming for some folks sometimes. So um, I encourage people to check out the website itself. Um, we, I will send out a recording of this. Uh, if you feel like you want to watch it again and hear, hear Tice's explanation again, that might be helpful. So we'll post it on our YouTube and I'll send out an email to everyone who registered. Um, probably in like a week, it'll take us a little bit to upload it onto YouTube because my computer is not that fast sometimes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, we should be getting that. And we'll also send out some of these links that I posted. So that way um, you don't have to frantically save them right now. Um, but I hope we see you guys again in, for, in a couple of weeks for some of our future webinars. I will also just do a really quick plug. We are a nonprofit organization and I know many people have already donated um, in support of this webinar, but if you felt inspired or moved or maybe a little scared um, or if you're just feeling things, um, we do really appreciate your donations and the donations that you make tonight do go directly to us at the state office. Um, it goes and funds Tice's work on the ground, Paul's work on the river, um, you know, helps fund my programs that I do with uh, youth and school kids um, in both New Mexico and Arizona. So we do appreciate anything that uh, you're able to give. But thank, thank you everybody for joining us tonight for this special Earth Day webinar. I hope you had a, a great night and learned some things um, and feel moved to action. So thanks everyone for joining us. See you, Katie. <laughs>